Hello. Uh, we're going to talk about rolling your own uh, Kubernetes clusters on OpenStack um, utilizing today. We're going to talk about the background of uh, deployments on Kubernetes, or I should say on OpenStack. Uh, with, and today we're going to talk about Ansible and Terraform. Uh, but first, just one of the quick introductions. This is Spencer Smith, the cloud engineer at Selenia on the consulting side. Uh, I'm Luke Heidecke. I am an engineering director at Selenia, also on the consulting side. Um, some background on Selenia, been in existence for about three years. Uh, we focus on open infrastructure, uh, including OpenStack, Kubernetes, and other solutions for uh, adopting those technologies within large global 500 enterprises. Um, we have offices in San Francisco, New York, uh, Asia Pacific, including Tokyo, and uh, Seoul, South Korea. Uh, we do sort of three prongs of work, consulting, training, and, and uh, a product side called Goldstone. Um, but both Spencer and I work a lot with clients to figure out um, during, especially initial phases, to figure out the adoption and um, sort of prove a concept early pilot phase of some of these uh, technologies. Um, and some of our work uh, within the past uh, year has been helping several uh, clients figure out uh, the space of Kubernetes, figure out how to, how to best deploy um, Kubernetes on top of their existing infrastructure. Um, and the, right, the, the clients we're really working with right now have uh, very large OpenStack environments uh, in, the, in some of them thousands of nodes um, across the world, and they're looking at how to um, adopt containers, how to adopt some of these uh, new architectures uh, on top of their in existing infra infrastructure, uh, but also look at um, sort of the overall playing field of Kubernetes and, and what the best practices might be for deploying these systems. Um, so today we're going to look at um, some of the options for deploying Kubernetes, um, some of the sort of production quality or quality of these solutions um, when looking at uh, them in regards to deploying on top of OpenStack. Um, we're going to look at those available tools and some of the tools that you can use outside of um, what is within the normal contrib, uh, contrib directories within uh, or contrib repos within Kubernetes. Um, and then we're going to do a, a a great demo uh, of the Kubernetes deployment on OpenStack that's going to work flawlessly, according to Spencer. Uh, so first, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Spencer. He's going to talk a little bit about uh, what he's going to kick off and kick it off, and we'll kind of go from there. Thanks, Luke. So is this working? I fell out of my pocket when I first got up here, so that was good. <laughs> um, yeah, so just to give a quick introduction of what we're going to do, um, we're going to try to launch an end-to-end -end deployment of Kubernetes on OpenStack um, using Terraform to do the, the provisioning of the infrastructure and then um, kicking off some Ansible playbooks to actually do the rollout of Kubernetes. Um, I've kind of wrapped these things and I'm going to show you before we start here if it'll work. I think I've got to go this way. All right, so I've wrapped it up in a shell script. Um, it's drop-dead simple, right? It's a, a Terraform apply. Um, I'm going to do a really lazy way to wait on CloudInit. I'm going to sleep for a minute and a half. And then I'm going to run the Ansible playbooks that we're going to use. Um, like I said, it's, we'll go into the actual playbooks. We'll talk about, you know, we'll see the Terraform scripts in a little bit. Um, but I'm going to kick it off now so that we've got some time. It takes about 10 or 12 minutes. All right, Luke, I think you're up. Yep. So throughout this conference, we're kind of uh, having some client meetings and also some discussions with uh, some of the Kubernetes community members. Uh, and a, quite a few of those have been focused on, a few, quite a few of those discussions have been focused on the challenges, uh, the current challenges in deploying Kubernetes on top of OpenStack and really getting a good picture of the, the basic options and, and the variety of options for uh, that are available within a Kubernetes deployment, including network and storage and, and things like that. Um, so there, there's, some, there's some initial challenges right now. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about the first, the options. So the, the, the first piece is uh, that if you wanted to today uh, figure out, not even looking at uh, OpenStack, if you're just looking to deploy Kubernetes, you have uh, some options of uh, local installs via Docker or Vagrant. Um, you have these turnkey, great turnkey cloud solutions uh, on Google, on uh, Amazon, on Azure that really 
uh, one button, maybe a, a few pieces of configuration of how large you want your cluster to be. Um, you can do a one button deploy and get a working Kubernetes environment on top of that cloud provider. Uh, the next piece is some of those, the custom cloud solutions uh, on things like AWS, on Rackspace, um, and those are also great, and they're a little more customizable. There might be an options between several OSs or a, a single or multi-master solution, um, and, and it kind of opens up, and, and the, the flexibility opens up as you start looking at these pieces. Um, and all these pieces, by the way, are available, to, uh, documented on Kubernetes.io, and they're all available within the, either the mainline or the contrib repos within the Kubernetes uh, org and GitHub. The, the next piece that you can look at is some of these custom bare metal um, solutions with Fedora, CentOS, um, Ubuntu, uh, and CoreOS that allow you to have a lot more um, uh, flexibility in how you, uh, in, in how you deploy Kubernetes, um, but that are still f uh, fairly opinionated on how you might um, uh, deploy Kubernetes within that environment. And uh, to be honest, uh, well, I'll go into the next piece, but uh, the, the, the next piece is Scratch, and then I'll go into the, the problem is, as you look at these solutions for what's available on OpenStack, um, you start having to cross out some of these things, and you really have these highly customized, sometimes very opinionated solutions, or you have to build everything from scratch. Um, as you're look, especially as clients are looking for the first time at uh, installing and testing out and, tr uh, and tr really seeing what's available within uh, the very powerful um, platform of Kubernetes, it's uh, not recommended to do it from scratch. You want a solution that is easily um, deployed so that you don't have to spend you know, the next um, you know, days or weeks, depending on <laughs> your, your luck, um, to install Kubernetes for the first time. Um, there's this tool within the Kubernetes repo called uh, Cube Up, which is really great, um, and there's some work being done within the community to improve these solutions, um, but uh, it's, it's not quite, the, the OpenStack, uh, I guess, option for <laughs> uh, deploying Kubernetes is not there yet. Um, but there are pull requests, and if you are interested, I uh, would urge you to try it out, um, to try the, the current PR, and uh, uh, Eeyore, uh, Ehor is also working on, um, and I sure would love some help on a, um, he works from Rantis, and would love some help also on looking at a non-heat solution um, for deploying OpenStack in sort of a turnkey manner for that initial uh, POC effort. Um, in the future, there, we're, we're also looking at, as a community, um, more production, um, production-grade installs of Kubernetes with Cube Up. Um, but at this time, uh, it's really looking at the, the POC level. So what do we start doing as we need to look at um, sort of the beyond the POC phase to a pilot install uh, of Kubernetes on OpenStack that's in a production-like scenario with the technologies that um, you might want as an enterprise. So um, things like tying in with Keystone, um, maybe changing some storage options, adding or not using Swift, um, depending on what your drivers are and how your networking is within, you know, can you use bridge mode um, with new time networking? If you're using uh, cloud, uh, I should say provider networks, uh, that might not be an option. So there's a lot of different questions you have to start asking and the current um, uh, solutions just aren't there. So as a community working a lot, highly recommend you take a look at those, uh, but for our clients, uh, none of what was really out there worked perfectly. Um, and w w we had a lot of fortune with uh, CubeSpray, which allowed us to kind of, and was, which he'll talk about later, of why that allowed us to give the flexibility of, of some of these deployment options um, to our customers with um, trying to deploy Kubernetes on OpenStack. Um, so, the, so some more background about what the challenges are for our customers is that, so the good news is that a lot of people looking at containers, a lot of people want to look at uh, Kubernetes as their orchestration and management platform. Um, so you see a lot of interest in containers, as you probably all know. The, the unfortunate part is that, um, especially with our clients running uh, definitely not Liberty, the Ice House or Kilo, unfortunately the, they either can't, won't, or both uh, support Magnum. Uh, and you know, looking at the latest survey numbers, you see Magnum on the bottom there, um, as far as production installs especially, um, of being able to, it, there's not a lot of likelihood if you have a, an existing large enterprise OpenStack installation that you can use Magnum. Um, also, you look at heat, 
and uh, not a lot of people either utilize or um, have chosen to enable heat within their environment, especially some of the older installs um, to support heat. So there needs to be some solution that doesn't utilize um, the sort of the best of, of uh, the most flexible for the largest uh, sort of audience to be able to at least try out um, Kubernetes before they decide to start changing their underlying infrastructure. So the next piece I'll hand over to Spencer, but Artros was a sort of a combination of a, 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 the, the, taking an existing tool and, and doing some wrappers around it to kind of give the best flexibility for a customer and trying to be able to just get their hands on a production-like install sure. of Kubernetes. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's kind of one of those things where, okay, there's not a good option. Our clients still want to a Kubernetes cluster, right? So, we chose to take a look at kind of rolling something ourselves in such a way that it, we felt it could be supportable, um, it could be production grade for them. Um, and so we did, you know, like we were talking about, did a little bit of, of digging around the community to see what was there. Um, and here's kind of what we came up with as, well, what we're showing you today for one. Um, but also, it seems to work pretty well. Um, we're using ish this same stack with some of our clients. Um, and it seemed to deploy pretty well across you know, some pretty, a pretty large amount of Kubernetes nodes. Um, so we're using Terraform as a way to, to define our infrastructure. Um, if you guys don't know about Terraform, you may or may not, but it's uh, developed by HashiCorp, the people that do Vagrant and, and all those good tools. Um, it's, it's just a way to define my infrastructure um, across several different clouds. They've got different providers. Um, so I define my infrastructure against OpenStack, and I say, give me this. And it does it. Um, and then we're rolling into Cube Spray Cargo. So they just changed the name. So we're, we're having a hard time remembering to call it Cargo. Um, but it's Cube Spray, and then the package inside of it that is the collection of, of playbooks is called Cargo. Um, it's all Ansible playbooks. It's, um, it, the goal here is to create a production level install, regardless of the host that you're going to run against, right? Um, we're also using Ubuntu 14.04 for the demo, uh, Kubernetes 1.2, the latest flannel, which I think is 0.55, um, and then an OpenStack Liberty Cloud that we've got in our test lab. So that's kind of the stack we're working with here. Um, the Terraform templates, let me make sure, let's see, okay, yeah, I got everything. Um, the Terraform templates that we're dealing with, there's only two. Um, you guys are gonna find that this is really pretty easy as far as you know, creating the infrastructure and it's it's really not that bad. I was kind of impressed by it. But uh, one template simply creates the OpenStack infrastructure. Uh, the other is going to drop an Ansible inventory file into the right place in the cargo directory. And then we're just going to launch cargo, and it's going to do its thing against those hosts. Um, as far as Ansible playbook options, if you're an Ansible fan, um, and I should say that we chose Ansible mainly because our clients are already using Ansible. Um, they develop expertise internally, and so we didn't want to compromise that by giving them yet another a way to deploy Kubernetes, right? Um, so as far as Ansible Playbooks, there's a couple of different ways that we've done it. Um, the first one is the community contrib repos, and so those are under the Kubernetes GitHub repo. Um, we, we found those to be, they work, um, but they're very Red Hat specific. Um, it seems like there's mostly Red Hat guys maintaining it. Um, it doesn't work with Ubuntu. It's, uh, it's single master, no HA, all that good stuff. Um, and then there's Q-Spray Cargo. So those are kind of the two that we were able to identify that seemed like they were well supported, they were actively being worked on. Um, there's some community around them. Uh, Cargo supports, like I said, it aims to be kind of a prod-ready deployment. Um, supports multi-master, um, you know, create an etc you know, etcd cluster, all that good stuff. Um, and it supports Ubuntu, supports the rail family of OSs, and will also support CoreOS if you want to deploy CoreOS with these playbooks as well. Um, so this is kind of what happens. Um, I'm not sure how good you guys in the back can see. <laughs> TV's a long way, but. Um, so there's two Terraform files. Um, here I'm just calling them 00 and 01. Um, but 00, zero is going to create my infrastructure in our OpenStack environment. Um, it's three VMs, a controller, two nodes. I keep calling it, I keep calling it a master, so if I do, sorry. But 
Um, and then 01, like I said, is going to take the infrastructure we created. It's going to create an Ansible inventory file out of that. And then it's going to drop it into the right place in the cargo directory. So that said, um, we can see if it worked. I'll be honest, and I've been having some issues with it today. Um, and if it doesn't work, it's going to be a perfect opportunity for us to encourage you guys to get involved with the community. Um, so um, I will show you the code first, though, so we can see what's happening. Um, here is what it looks like to define infrastructure. And that looks probably really small for you guys inside of Terraform. So there's several variables at the top, uh, number of nodes that I want to create. I'm doing a single master only for the demo, but uh, number of nodes, internal floating I or internal IPs, floating IP pool, what image I want to use, the flavor, all your standard um, OpenStack stuff, um, an availability zone that is faster than their other one, so I'm not having to specify that guy. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go through, it creates a single, um, a single floating IP for the master, um, and I'm doing that by itself just for some naming reasons, but um, the single master IP, uh, the single master node, like I said, you know, use all the variables we defined above in order to create that guy. Um, so then two floating, or two node IPs, it's, it, you know, I'm using the count variable here, you guys can see. Um, so I've specified two in my configs, so it's going to create two floating IPs for that, and then it will create two nodes for that as well. Um, the variables that we're seeing at the top, they're empty, so I'm requiring you to define those. And like I said, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's the same thing you would see if you're doing a Nova boot. Um, you know, Nova nodes, internal IP pool, all that good stuff. Um, nothing too crazy. So. Um, the second file, the second Terraform file, uh, create inventory. So this one's a little uglier, but it works. Um, I'm using the Terraform local exec provisioner. And so what's that, what that's going to do is it's going to take the output from the first definition and the creation of those OpenStack resources, and it's going to put them into an Ansible config file or an Ansible inventory file that allows Ansible to talk to the proper servers. Um, I know what the file needs to look like, so I'm basically doing some echo hackery here to just write it in where it needs to go. Um, and then it looks like this at the end of it, right? So this is the example one. I didn't want to give you our IPs, really. But, um, you know, so node name, the SSH host, um, and the IP of how to get to it. Um, this would be what a multi-master inventory would look like. So if I wanted to create two masters, you know, three etcd, uh, cluster, this is what it looks like. So that said, we are not done. Um, we are still provisioning our Kubernetes environment. Uh, it, like I said, sometimes it tends to take a while. It kind of appears that one of our guys failed here. So it's probably not going to work anyways. <laughs> um, so that said, I can at least show you what, ha what it looks like in OpenStack. So it's Three nodes, they're named the right way, they've got the floating IPs, the image name we want them to have. Um, like I said, it's pretty dead simple when it, when it works. But, um, you know, yet here we are. <laughs> and so let's figure out what comes next. So we'll roll back at the end and see if it works. Like I said, I think it's going to fail, but we'll double check kind of at the end. Um, so the question you may ask given it not working especially, is why would you want to deploy this way? And the answer is you wouldn't, don't, unless you have to, right? So there are a few reasons from our clients that we're seeing that they have to deploy this way. It's things like they're running some really old cloud, you know, something Juno or earlier, with no upgrade path even on the horizon, right? So it's just super old, it's not gonna support it. it, you know, they can't use something like Magnum, they, you know, they don't want to install Magnum for whatever reason. Um, upgrading the cloud's a nightmare, they've written custom network plugins, they've had hired Cisco to write a custom network plugin or something, or some other, you know, network provider, um, and, and the upgrade is just crazy town, right? Um, the other thing is long testing cycles, you know, they're, yeah, we want to do Magnum, that's fine, but it's going to take us six months to get it installed on our cloud, right? So what do you do in the meantime? 
We still want to do Kubernetes. We want to build expertise there. Um, the other last one, and this one is actually surprisingly more common, is the client's just an end user of the cloud, right? He has no control over what the cloud admins are going to install, what they're going to do, or their you know, cloud admin's a big meanie and he won't install it for them. So, uh, you know, we've got to figure workarounds, right? Um, and so we chose, like I said, we chose uh, Terraform and Ansible um, for our clients basically because of familiarity. Um, they're not comfortable using heat. They are comfortable using Terraform. They're guys know the language. Minimizing the roadblocks to deploying Kubernetes is good for them. And so that's where we've been. But beware, right? So there's, as you guys can see, is there are bugs that, that pop up here. I've been having some flannel issue all day trying to get this thing going. Um, so there's going to be bugs. Be prepared for that. Be prepared to track down some really funky issues. Be prepared to know what's coming down the pipe from Kubernetes. If things are going to fundamentally change on you between 1.1 and 1.2 or something like that, and you want to deploy it quickly, know that's coming down the pipe. So one of the things to think about is there's redemption on the horizon here. Right, so there's a, a very active community that's working towards good Kubernetes solutions. Um, we met, when was that? What day was that? Wednesday? I don't know, I'm losing track of days here, but um, we, we met with the, uh, the Kubernetes OpenStack SIG. Um, we had a really great meeting around talking about the cube up scripts we were touching on a minute ago. Um, spent an hour with those, those guys, and it, it's a good community that's starting to develop, to develop around having OpenStack run Kubernetes well. Um, so, you know, encourage you guys to become a part of that and reach out there. So, as far as lessons learned that we've had trying to do this for our clients, is the community needs a lot of help. Like we are talking about the OpenStack SIG, they're just now getting started. Uh, in the past month or two, we've kind of just kicked things off and defined a vision. Um, lots of code commits to make, right? There's lots of issues in the playbooks that we've used, lots of things that can, you, in, lots of ways for people to contribute. Um, and the project moves quickly, right? So it's, if you don't call into the Kubernetes meetup, it seems like it's impossible to keep up with what's coming down the pipe. Um, you know, I, it's like 1.2 is a, a ton of huge changes, deployment API and ingress API and all that stuff comes in. It's just hard to keep up, so be prepared to, to listen and, and keep up with what's going on. Um, the other thing is be prepared to either maintain a fork of the playbooks that you're going to use or generalize your environment in such a way that you don't have to. So it, depending on what your environment looks like, it can be very hard to get the playbooks to work and you wind up hacking a bunch of crap together. And then you're tasked with supporting that, right? So, Pick your battles, I guess. If you want the newest stuff, the newest playbooks, the newest Kubernetes deployment methods, try to keep your environment general enough to support that. And then lastly, you know, the things we're talking about today may not apply six months from now. All right, so talking again about a fast-moving environment, if Magnum all of a sudden is deploying production-ready clusters, it no longer makes sense to try to do it some other way unless you have a really good reason. Um, there's some work going on around that as far as defining some reference architectures. Um, you know, what, what, a, what a production ready Kubernetes cluster looks like on OpenStack, um, which is another way to, to contribute back. We'd love to hear more about what people are running internally and what's working for them. And so that said, Luke, let's tell community. Do, do you want to check on the... Uh... I can check, but I'm telling you, it's Mi not going to work. Miracles happen. You can do some live troubleshooting, <laughs> too, right? Yeah, we're still running. OK. <laughs> so wanted to wrap up uh, with a little bit of just uh, idea of the community resources available, a little bit more on the community. The ideal is that, uh, especially during an initial POC, initial, um, uh, you know, especially pi pilot phase stuff, that uh, a, a community uh, supported resource like CubeUp um, is available and is, uh, is a seamless experience for users of, whether it's Amazon, Google, 
or OpenStack or Azure, um, that, they're, that you're able to try it out um, to, to see a, a working um, instance of Kubernetes, and then to hopefully that there's also some level of customization available. Um, there's a lot of work being done currently on that, um, and also on the reference architectures for what you would want to include in both something like the Kubernetes uh, maintained cube up, but also what does a production Kubernetes cluster look like on OpenStack so that um, projects like Magnum or Murano can utilize those, um, those architectures and that pe people as a, um, in a, in a generic community sense, are happy with what they end up with um, and that you actually utilize those tools. Um, so to get help as you start looking at these things, uh, the Kubernetes Slack um, uh, channel at slack.k8s.io um, is a great resource. Um, I'm on there a lot. Uh, Spencer, there's a lot of other uh, great people that are uh, looking at um, that Slack channel and monitoring it. There's a, a specific one for the SIG OpenStack group. Um, that uh, is monitored for specific uh, uh, OpenStack uh, integration issues um, for Kubernetes. Um, the next piece is the Kubernetes community hangouts. Um, the, uh, Sarah from Google has a great calendar on the community site um, that lists all of the various uh, community hangouts upcoming and events and things like that um, that Google and other people will be talking about Kubernetes um, at. And then there's also the contribute, uh, contrib modules and open source from KubeSpray that are available for there. Um, speaking of SIG, the next meeting is May 3rd, every other Tuesday um, at 1 p.m. Pacific. There's a Google Hangout, or I think, yes, yeah, still Hangout. Um, <laughs> and if you, Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> if you go to uh, the Google Groups, you can sign up for calendar uh, updates and things like that. Um, and then if you're in the Southern California, in the LA area, in El Segundo, AT&T Entertainment is hosting um, at their space right near the airport, um, a meetup for where Google's gonna talk about continuous delivery using Jenkins on Kubernetes. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, another one of our installs using a, um, with a target install of uh, Kubernetes in the hundreds or thousands of nodes, so large scale Kubernetes clusters on OpenStack and some of the challenges of, of the current challenges of uh, getting that um, done for a client. And then uh, the third speaker uh, from Amgen is gonna talk about the challenges and lessons learned of uh, integrating a uh, large scale pass uh, for the enterprise there. Um, and I believe uh, there's going to be food and, and things like that also provided by Apprenda. Um, so that should be a fun time and free food and beer. So it's always a, a good call for me to go to anything. <laughs> um, definitely give a, call, uh, give a reach out on Twitter. Um, we're always hiring and uh, join us in Los Angeles for sure. We'll be there. Um, guys from uh, quite a lot of the different Kubernetes user groups within the LA area will also be there to kind of chat and um, should be some good stuff there. Do you want to take one more look? We can see right now if uh, we can see the output product there. False but hope, man. I, I'm full of it, yeah. yeah tell okay. You, flannel, it's flannel <laughs> all day long. It's been crazy town. All right, yeah. So anyway, we'll open it up for questions. Um, anybody got anything to ask? There's mics, by the way, um, if you don't mind using them. The guys in the back like it when you do. What's that? The, the, the fortunate part, I, what was the problem with flannel earlier today? It's, it, it, there's a step where it generates the subnet env file and it just hangs for no reason. It, it's, it's, pulling, it's pulling an image from key, it's pulling the flannel image from key and it just sometimes doesn't seem to work and there's a 10 minute timeout in the, in the playbooks and it's just like, I, I don't know. I haven't figured it out yet. I haven't figured out what's, what's taking so long, why it's, why it's breaking. But, um, and then it's like it'll work for a couple of them, but not like the third one. And so it won't get, it won't even be, you know, it's dead as far as Ansible is concerned. So. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks.